there are three, four, or five people who who knew the sermon this morning. Um, the scripture as I read with them yesterday as we went uh, uh, for Andrew Link. And uh, I just asked him a question. I said, yeah, what, what do you think about when you hear the reading of this passage of Scripture? What's the first thing that comes into your mind? He shared some things with me, which uh, uh, most of them I thought about, but there were a couple that I hadn't thought about. So uh, probably for all of us. But the one thing that I've thought about since yesterday is a part of that is... Uh, what um, I remember that was connected, and I think I've shared it with you before. Uh, one of my church members said when I was serving at St. John in Oakland County, and again I was preaching on uh, a series on the Lord's Prayer, and I remember him coming out one Sunday morning after three or four sermons, and he said, Preacher, I'm ready for a feel good sermon. I don't know about you, but uh, over the last few weeks we've talked about those things that. Uh, that Jesus said that we wish he hadn't said, and the things that Jesus knows that we wish he didn't know. And uh, if you don't feel that way, then, you know, part for me is I'm, I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready for one of those more feel good. And what you don't understand, well, some of you would, is that the last several Sundays are the lectionary readings for this particular year that comes from Luke's Gospel. And what you don't know is that lectionary is a cycle every three years. You know, there's, there's a gospel lesson, one in particular. John's kind of intertwined with those, but Matthew, Mark, and Luke are for each year. You spend more time in that particular gospel. Then there's an epistle reading, and there's a psalm, and then there's also an Old Testament reading in the midst of that. And the funny thing for, no, it's not funny. The, the interesting thing for me is why would those of sometimes things that Jesus said that we didn't like, we wish he hadn't, or the things that Jesus knows that we wish he didn't know, all kind of come at the same time. This year, at this time, in your life and in my life, there's a reason for it. There's a reason for it, and part of what you may not realize today is that you're not here today by chance. God has something to say to all of us. And if you pay attention to the scriptures, to get to the end real quick, is that the rich man and his brothers had ignored the word of Moses and the prophets again and again and again and again. And you know what? We're not any different. There are things that we've heard over and over and over and over again, and we have chosen to ignore it. Or we've done it for a while and then we just kind of forget about it. So hold on. Let me ask you this question. Some of you know this story. I don't want to read a part of it so I don't forget it, but uh, you'll understand. What parable would make a person with three doctoral degrees, one in medicine, one in theology, one in philosophy, to leave civilization as we know it, with all of its culture and its amenities, and depart for the jungles of darkest Africa. What would draw a concert organist to go to a place where there is no organ? What would motivate someone to give up a teaching position in a prestigious university to go to people with superstitions from the dark ages? The man who did that because of this parable was Dr. Albert Schweitzer. This parable got a hold of him in such a way that he was ready to walk away from it all and do something totally different. Conviction. Troubling. 
bringing him to a place that he said, I've got to change. And now that's a big change. It's a change for all of us, and God continues to deal with that. The rich man, and some of you have probably heard him called Dives, uh, the Gospels never mention his name. The church is the one who's given him that name. Do you know what the name means? In Latin, it means rich man. So that makes sense, doesn't it? But here he was. He was comfortable in every way. He was self-indulgent. Indulgent. He was a connoisseur. Uh, he loved the arts. And he uh, loved fine dining and all the things that were living and wanted the best of everything. He was always dressed in purple, as Mrs. Trace said. Purple was the most expensive dye in that particular day. It was only afforded by the rich and the famous as a part of that. One commentator says, even his undergarments were fine linen. Everything was the best. The other man is Lazarus. Now this is not the same Lazarus that Jesus raised from the dead. But in this parable, he's one, he's considered really homeless. We're told he's crippled and can't walk. It says that they laid him at the gate. He couldn't even get there on his own. It's a part of it. He barely makes it from day to day, and he makes it off of the crumbs from the table. Just leftovers. And the rich man passed him every day. But Lazarus is a survivor. One day Jesus said both of them died. Isn't it interesting that he says when Lazarus died, he went to the lamp of Abraham. And for the rich man, it just says he was buried. We think about those things. One thing we need to realize that uh, we all have to look at it sometime or another is that death is the great equalizer. No one really cares about your social standing when you're dead and gone as a part of that. I can just imagine if the rich man is, was as rich as they say he was, man, I'll tell you, it must have been some kind of funeral. There were a lot of folks that were probably there. But it wasn't the same for Lazarus. Maybe not been anybody. Nobody recognizes it as a part of it, but Jesus talks about those. Jesus says about Dominus, he said to Mary, but, but Dominus again must have recognized those things. Jesus did add one additional comment about the rich man. You know what that is, don't you? His soul went to hell. Kind of unnerving. Probably was unnerving for Schweitzer. It may have been a bit unnerving for us. So how would you and I have looked at ourselves in this parable? <clears throat> have you ever thought about that? Do you see yourself in this parable? Well, let's see. Let me just use myself, okay? I'm not a rich man. I'm not a poor man. Probably most of us would consider ourselves in between. But in the standards of the world, we're all rich in comparison to what other persons have. So how can I see myself in this parable? Well, the way I see it, I'm one of the brothers. Now, for safety's sake today, I want you to know it says five brothers, but I'm going to change it a little bit. There were three brothers and two sisters. We don't want to leave ladies out. That were still living just like you and me. Still living. Still with opportunity. Still with challenges as a part of our lives. Well, let's look at it a little bit closer. Well, think about those scriptures. The first thing that, uh, that I see as a part of it, and you could probably see it, is the rich man was distracted. Do you have any distractions in your life? 
Ken in his prayer said uh, he was a part of it. The business of last week or those things that are going to be busy in this coming week. My question is, you know, are you really here this morning? What happened last week is gone forever. Maybe in our minds some of it's still there, but we can't go back and change that. We don't have the promise of next week. But sometimes there's, there's distractions as a part of that. But this rich man was given an opportunity, and think about this, I'm reminding myself, he was given an opportunity when he left his house every morning, he walked by Lazarus. And every afternoon when he came back, he walked by Lazarus. Opportunity. He saw him and he did nothing. Well, you might say, well, he left it in crumbs. But I don't think probably if Jesus was telling, as Jesus was telling the story, he paid a whole lot of attention. He probably asked one of the servants to just kind of put things together. I don't want to get crumbs or gravy on my fingers, so just wrap it up. And he'd walk out the gate and just kind of flip it over to Lazarus and never looked at him. Really, they were neighbors. But he never paid any attention to it. Sometimes for us, we get in a rut, and the rut becomes a grave, and we're buried in a hole of distractions of an overoccupied life. Too much stuff. Things all of us, if we're honest with ourselves, know that it occupies our times, our energy, our minds as a part of it. And sometimes we just like to take some of that stuff off of our plates. But then when we get something off, we want to put something back on. Because there's supposed to be a full plate. I remember a few years ago as a part of it, and I guess it was one of the first times that, uh, that some of the restaurants started doing a senior meal. You know, it was about half of what the other one was, and it was cheaper as a part of that. And I've heard folks say as they get older, they can't eat as much as a part of that. But yet, you and I, we go to the potluck or whatever, you know, and I've said this before, my brothers, I kept saying, I wish I had sideboards for my plate. And my two brothers brought me sideboards one Christmas for a Christmas gift so I can have a little extra room on the plate. We have it piled up and it all runs together. We don't keep it separated. Then there's a few folks who just keep things separated and you can't see the plate because food is not supposed to touch. Now what happens when you eat it? Does it not touch each other? I don't know. I have to ask Doc. Doc, does that happen? Does it, does it just one part, one food goes one place and one goes the other? I mean, everybody says, you know, I got a, I got a sweet hope left in my stomach. That's there with everything else. But we think about those things. But remember, go back. Go back with me for a minute to the Old Testament. What God says as the Israelites are preparing to cross the Jordan over into the Promised Land. Deuteronomy 8, 10 through 14 says this. When you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine homes and settle down, when your herds and flocks are large and your silver and your gold increase, when all you have is multiplied, do not become proud in your heart and forget the Lord your God. When you have everything, Sometimes we get distracted. Sometimes we need to be shaken so that we can be awakened. I think that's probably what happened to, to Dr. Albert Schweitzer. There was something that grabbed a hold of his heart and his life, and it changed him. Have you ever had those life-changing experiences? And some of them probably have revolved around matters of faith, and when we sense and do the closeness and the nearness of God, well, what's changed? God hasn't changed. We have. Sometimes we need those things to awaken us and bring it back as a part of that. Because there's a time that in those distractions of our lives is that they affect our ability to share with others. 
Some of you have heard me say before, I served at St. John in the edge of, well, it was in Oldham County, but it was on the edge of Jefferson and Oldham County in a place called Prospect. Prospect, at that particular time when I was serving, had the largest per capita income of any zip code in the United States. I don't know some of my folks knew about it. They did here and said, well, you're serving there. I bet you're getting all kinds of money from uh, folks there at the church. And I said, this, let me tell you something. This is a part of it. They didn't get all of that money by giving it away. They may have given some away, but they kept plenty for themselves. But sometimes we forget about others in the midst of that. Jesus gives us an image of the rich man He's burning in hell because he ignored the poor man in front of his home. It's a disturbing image, and it should be for us as a part of that. Yet sometimes we need that, that, that shaking in our lives to give us courage to make the right decisions, and even though sometimes they're tough decisions, not just with finances, but with caring and loving other people. We're called to heed the warnings. The focus is not... I want you to hear this because there was someone who said at that point, I've heard folks talk about this, the focus of this is not about the afterlife. Jesus' parable is not about what happens after we die. Are you ready? Do you know what it is about? It's about now. Right now. serves as a warning as we think about it. It's more about the five brothers, or the three brothers and two sisters. It's more about them. They're still alive. They still have an opportunity. It shows us also that God reverses the things of the way they are in the world. It's a different part of that. We all know the names of the rich and famous. You could probably name a bunch of them. Some of you even don't know where I need to stop from. I'll stop and preach and go to meddle and something. Some of us just need to get rid of, of those magazines that talk about the lives of the rich and famous. Probably because we're not going to be there. Never have been. Never will be. But we read about that. But there are a lot of poor folks. A lot of poor folks is a part of that as we live. And we don't know their name and we don't even take the time to know their name. Somebody named them when they were born. And yet we don't know the name. You know about the Potter's Fields, don't you? Potter's Fields that are all over the country is a part of that. They're places that, that where cemeteries where the poor are buried and it doesn't cost them anything. But there's a little hitch to it. There are no grave markers. No names. No names are allowed. Just small numbers. If I read the scriptures correctly, I can tell you assuredly that this is God will know the name of every poor person and suffering person in this world who ever walked this earth. He'll know the name. And I hope God knows my name when I get there, but I know He will know the names of the poor. One of my seminary professors said one day, and I've thought about it numerous times, and it kind of surfaced again this week with this scripture. And he said, Be prepared to stand in line when you get to heaven because the poor and the homeless will be in front of you. How do you like that? Jesus and God talked numerous times about those who have nothing, about those of us who have everything. Realize that Diabetes, the rich man, he wasn't a neat man. At least the scripture doesn't tell us that does the trash. He didn't, he didn't kick Lazarus. He didn't tell him to go away. He didn't tell them, why don't you get up from there and go get a job? 
Yet, even though the rich man was not a mean man, it wasn't enough to get him to heaven. What did he do that deserved his outcome? He acted as though it was all supposed to play out this way. He never, it never occurred to him that the fate of Lazarus and for him could change. To him, Lazarus had just become part of the landscape. Just something that was there that we, that we ignored. The rich man had become indifferent to Lazarus' plight, indifferent to his hunger, and indifferent to his needs. It reminded me of the story of Garfield the cat. I'll get you back. You don't like this. Do you remember seeing this part of it, a cartoon in the park? Garfield is sitting there, and you know, the window's open, it's snowing, it's cold, and he's sitting there cozy in the chair, and he turns around and he looks out the window, and there's an Obi. Obi's got his nose up against the glass, just long and begging to be inside. Garfield's little comment says, you know, I can't stand it, I can't stand it. Here I am, comfortable and warm, and Obi's outside, cold, and probably hungry, and born again. He said, I've got to do something. So he gets up and he goes over and he pulls the curtain where you can't see Obi anymore. There are all kinds of things on YouTube and sometimes that we see as a part of it. And one that Shelly shared with me is that a guy sitting at the, at the stop sign as a part of it. And there's a guy that's homeless and got a sign out there at that point. And the guy in the car looks up at the and the guy's eyes sitting on the corner are just kind of beating down on the guy in the car. And what does he do? He looks over this way he looks down like most of us do. Finally, he goes out from the stop sign and he gives the impression that once he turned the corner, he stopped. Instead of just ignoring again. Sometimes we've been guilty of just pulling the curtain. Davies begs. He begs, first of all, to come back and tell his brothers. He begs and asks for Lazarus to dip his finger in, in the water and cool his parching tongue. Kent Wayne said yesterday, isn't it strange that the rich man now in the hill never got the picture? He's still expecting Lazarus to serve him. He says to go back and tell my brothers. Wouldn't it be nice if this parable ended like Dickens' Christmas Carol? Or they tell Scrooge, you know, Scrooge got changed ways. It's a part of that. Scrooge has the visions that come, and, and we know the ending is that he changed. But Abraham says to the rich man, No, you're not sending anybody back. They have Moses and the prophets, and again, a reminder, how many preachers, how many sermons, how many times have we heard those things? Sometimes we've responded as we should respond. Sometimes we've responded and then we've forgotten, and then there are those who've not responded. Jesus is asking us again to respond with whole hearts. Davies had everything on earth, but he missed the kingdom of God. The good news today is there is good news. The good news is that you and I still have an opportunity to change. Our life's probably not perfect. But you and I know there's opportunities that we've missed to be the representation of God. But I can tell you, I believe with all of my heart that there's, that God has, was in Lazarus. That God is in that homeless person that you saw last who was on the corner asking for food or asking for work. God is in that person that you and I walk by in the supermarket and know that uh, every penny that they have is going just for a few items and they're not the items that we're putting in our baskets. 
God is in every one of those things and in every person that we meet. And the part is sometimes the greatest thing which can be hell that you and I may not know about it is our attitude against them and us. We're not like those people. You may not know the name of their friends. Remember that God knows their name. And the good news is that we can tell you that God reaches out every day to the lives of those in need and invites us to embrace them. To do something, even in a small way, the sermon title was, If Only. If Only. If Only. If Only we were back in the sanctuary, I could hear God. If Only we didn't have to be in the gym, I could hear God. If only God would show me some great revelation and remind me that would kind of awaken me and shake, it, shake me as a part of it, then I would do more than what I'm doing. Or if one of my relatives could just come back for a few moments and share their life with me again, if only. The question is, what are we going to do now? Not just about matters of money, but about our time, our energy, about our love, about our forgiveness, about our serving. Now. And all I can say, I'll say it for me and let you listen in, is I need to continue to bring about some change in me. If I were to know the heart and the will of God, then there's some things in me that still need to change. I love the little song the children sing. He's still working on me. I pray that he's still working on me.